any questions about your what, what's due today? I, I think today is week eight homework. If you can have it in, that'd be great. If you're a little bit behind, try to try to get caught up so that you're not too far behind, and so that you get two cracks at your your work right once uh, uh, initially, so I can mark it, and then another time to do your corrections. If you miss that, then you get what you get the first time. And if I have an opportunity to go back and and do another go of your corrections, maybe I'll do it. But it's 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 crunch time now, and I would hate for you to um to uh, run out of time. And uh, as I was saying, I'm hoping not to spend too much time with you guys in quarter four if I can help it. Um, your online quiz is open. Take that up to three times. You take your best mark. That's the nervous system thing. You can be working on your um, your review package. Oh, hey. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you know, though. And... Um, I'll get you those answers uh, so you can cross-check them um, maybe tomorrow. So if you save one of your quizzes, you might have the uh, answer key to the uh, to the um, the uh, review package to to help you along. Okay. So, um, and then Wednesday next week, you guys are coming in for your last session with me, which is your face-to-face -face sit down test. Now, if um, things go a little bit sideways, which it may, uh, the number seems to be uh, upticking a little bit for this. Um, for this last, uh, the, the end of the quarter here for, for COVID numbers. If that happens, we'll record the lessons and you'll have the lessons and then we'll just do a remote online quiz, you know, starting Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for reproduction. And we'll just take that mark instead, okay? So I don't know if you're now hoping that we, 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 we were asked to stay at home, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's just in case if we're asked to stay at home uh, starting any time from now until, until the next quarter, okay? Any questions? Okay, so start working on your week nine um, work so that we can hand it in and I can get that marked and hand it back to you and, and then uh, be part of your, uh, your, your overall quarter three mark, okay? If you can pull out your package of images for your reproductive unit or reproduction unit, we'll go over the male parts today then we'll take a little bit of a break, maybe watch a little video. Um, and then we'll talk about the female bits a little bit. Okay, so we, uh, we'll see how far we get into it. And again, I know it's a little bit heavy, but um, our hope is that we get far enough that uh, tomorrow is a light, light day. Okay. So is that on? I think that's on. Okay, the male bits. Now the male bits are super duper straightforward. Um, even though they're, they're, when we come to talk about their hormones, it's super duper easy. Whereas the female um, system is a little bit more complicated and it requires, usually if there's a linear year, we, we, we spend a whole week on the female reproductive uh, uh, system because it's so complicated. So the male bits, so let's take a look. <laughs> Does anyone need the package? Oh, okay. Here you go. No, oh, I have it here. And here's the review package then too. All right, there we go. So the male reproductive system. Let's take a look at it. So here's the image that you got. This is a side view. Uh, this, this volunteer had his right leg amputated for this photo. So we removed the right thigh and, uh, butt. And so this is the left butt cheek. And then this is the inside of the person. So, um, kudos for the guy that volunteered to do this. This is the front view. Okay. So, um, uh, I don't know if you see it. It kind of looks like an elephant and this one's the side view. And this would be the element coming at you. Okay. Now there's a whole bunch of bits in there. It gets a there's a lot of lot of numbers, lots of arrows. We're going to be labeling this one, and then we'll just tell you where it is on this one, okay? Because this one's got more stuff, more detail. There's a couple pieces in here that are not part of the reproductive system, 
Does anyone see anything there that, that shouldn't be there maybe? Yeah. Yeah, the rectum's in there. Just making sure it's, yeah. The rectum's in here, this bad boy right here. That's part of your pooping system, your digestive system. Nothing to do with baby making. Okay, that I know of at least. Uh, nothing about baby making. Anything else? Yeah. The bladder, that thing right there and right there. That thing stores, that's called the urinary bladder. It's holding pee. And we, you may not know this, but pee's got nothing to do with <laughs> making babies, or reproduction. Now, humans do something called um, sexual reproduction. And that's where we, we have an, uh, a haploid cell join a haploid cell. The haploid cell from a boy is called a sperm, right? And the haploid cell from a female uh, is called an egg or an ova. And when they fuse together, that's called fertilization. And it goes from haploid, haploid, 23, 23, to diploid. And that's a 46 chromosome cell, OK? Now, other organisms do something called asexual reproduction. Humans can't do that uh, naturally. We've done it in a lab, and it's called cloning. And that's where we take a, the DNA out of a 46 or a diploid cell, and we suck the DNA out. So if this is the cell, there's the DNA. We would suck the DNA out. Then we, we go into the same organism, right? And we pull out an egg that only has 23 chromosomes, and we suck the 23 chromosomes and throw it away. And then we take the 46 and put it into the egg. And then we would treat it with some chemicals. And then we would say, go. And it would start dividing. And that's how we clone it. So it's genetically identical to the original parent cell, which is weird because the, the new organism, the child, is genetically identical to the parent. So they're actually brother, sister, 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 brother, brother, in, 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 or actually identical twin um, to, the, um, to the offspring. Now, the first multicellular organism of any decent size that had, had done, uh, we've done this to was a sheep, right? The sheep was named Dolly. And uh, it was called Dolly because the DNA that they, they, they extracted the DNA from, so the cell they extracted the DNA from, sorry, was from, a, a, it's kind of a strange story, but they took it from a mammary gland, a breast cell. And Dolly Parton is this country Western singer that has large mammaries. So they called the, the baby sheep Dolly. So we're, that's the connection anyways. So they took the DNA, put it into a sheep egg, and then did some treatment to it. And then the egg started to divide. And then they ended up with a, a baby sheep. And that was genetically identical to the mother sheep. Now, the only issue was, um, the baby seemed to have some some issues with um, with um, with its health, um, and they think it's got to do with the fact that we started off with old DNA, and then the cell divided using old DNA, and then the DNA got older and older and older. It's a, it's an issue called uh, when we have cell division, the telomeres, the DNA chromosome ends get shorter and shorter and shorter, and we think that might be a bit of a problem. So it had arthritis and stuff like that. And, it, and it, it, even at an, a, a fairly young age, it had lots of old ailments, old person's ailments, old sheep's ailments. So that's an example of, um, of asexual reproduction. It requires lots of lab technology and technique. I think now if you're, you, you have a pet cat or dog or gerbil or whatever and it dies, you can get it cloned. You can actually have it genetically copied and then it comes out. And you'll be surprised to know that sometimes they don't look the same. They don't act the same, right? Obviously, they, they, they often have health issues as well. But typically, mammals and humans, when they want to reproduce, they have to have an egg and a sperm meet up. Okay, and that's called sexual reproduction. So we're going to start off by numbering the, 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 the first part of the reproductive system in the boy. And then uh, we're going to take the path until it comes out of the boy uh, so that it can um, fertilize an egg. And it's not in numerical order. So we got we to gotta start with number eight. Number eight is the seminiferous tubules. This is the site of sperm production. And we make sperm through a process called meiosis, right? Uh, diploid cells turn into haploid cells. And this happens in the seminiferous tubules. Now, we don't even see them here. We see them here. So inside of that thing that looks like a marble, looks like an avocado seed, um, if we were to cut the avocado seed in half, you would see all these little uh, tubes inside. 
And inside of those tubes, uh, sperm cells are maturing inside of them. Okay? So that's number eight. Number eight, right here, is the seminiferous tubules, and we find them inside of number seven here, which looks like an avocado. Now, it's really dense. Like, it's, it, it's not soft. Like, you think tubes would be kind of soft and smushy. It's, it's, it's dense and, and hard. If you were to suffer from, like, testicular cancer or, or there was traumatic injury, like someone bonked you there and you had to have it removed, often they would replace it with, uh, like, a prosthetic, like a plastic prosthetic. And it'd be, you know, something similar in weight and density and firmness. And it's, it's, it's hard. So this thing, even though it's got tubes in it, it's, it's firm. Okay? So that's number eight right here. Now, this whole thing here, right, so we, we numbered it number 11, is called your testicle. Well, not yours, but called the testicle. You have two of them, uh, usually, and they're called your testes. Uh, those are the male gonads. Gonads stands for sexual reproductive organ. And for males, it's the testes. For the female, uh, it's the ovaries. You have two of them, left and right, and um, they are external to the body. They actually are not inside the body. Women, you know, if you're born uh, female sex, right, not gender but sex, uh, you would have XX chromosomes, and your gonads would be in your abdominal cavity, in your insides. Well, boys... Uh, at a certain phase in their life or development in the, in the uterus, they actually descend. They leave the abdominal cavity, and they, they come out of the abdominal cavity and hang between um, in, in the groin region. And they hang in something called the scrotum or the scrotal sac. And this scrotal sac is uh, this fleshy uh, uh, pocket of flesh or skin. And it's to suspend them outside of the body because testicles actually work best a couple of degrees cooler than the human body. So the human body is 36.7 degrees or slightly higher, slightly lower. Well, testicles don't like it. They don't like it too warm. So they actually hang on the outside of your body and they're about 36, 35 degrees. And that's optimal sperm formation or development uh, temperature. In fact, if you are having, like, if you, you get married or you have a partner and you, you choose to have a child and you happen to be a traditional, you know, male, female, uh, and you're trying and you can't do it, right? Sometimes it, it takes a while to have a kid. Um, one of the first things the doctor will tell you is stop wearing uh, tidy whitey underwear. Because the tidy whitey underwear holds it up against your flesh, up, up against your, your, your groin there, and it, it, this may be too warm. So they say, you got to go boxers, uh, which boxer shorts, uh, they don't have the little pouchy pocket to hold them up. It's just like you're, you're just out there. And then your, your, your body gets to, you know, control the temperature of them by, and it's really strange, and uh, girls, you have to believe me, uh, but when it gets, you know, if you go into a sauna or jacuzzi, this, the, these guys will adjust by lowering a little bit so that you can stay cooler. And if you're on a really cold day, right, you're in the morning and you're going for a dip in the lake and you're like, oh my gosh, it's really cold. These guys actually adjust by moving upwards a bit to mo pull them close to your body so that they're at the optimal temperature. Not too cold, not too hot, right? It's kind of like baby bear and the three bears. Uh, they, they, they just want to be just perfect. And they can actually fluctuate up and down a little bit to control the temperature. And that's due to your scrotal sac, your scrotum. Ready? There was this TV show called Wonder Years. You guys ever watch that? And, and there, it's about this boy, and it's kind of like he's, you know, the formative years of his life when he's maybe 10, 11, 12, 13. It's like when he first gets a crush on his, his neighbor, Winnie, and, and his best friend's a bit of a geek. But he had an older brother, Bully, that would beat him up all the time and stuff like that. And his nickname, his, his brother's nickname for him was Scrout. He's, that's what he, <laughs> it's a terrible nickname, Scrout. Um, <clears throat> now, right here, it kind of looks like a worm, kind of yucky. That is called your epididymis. Epi meaning above, so it sits on top here. 
And the epididymis is where this, the sperm that's made here, they travel to this section here to mature. So if we, we treat this, the, this, uh, the seminiferous tubule as kind of like you know, preschool, elementary school, they kind of take form. Well, they actually mature and figure out how to fully function by uh, sitting in the epididymis for a while. Not only that, that's where we store it. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, males will produce sperm. It takes, you know, from start to finish, nine to ten weeks for that one sperm to turn into, like, a, a fully functioning sperm. And then we can store it there. And then when it's time to release the sperm, which is 400 to 500 million at a time, right, this will contract and s send them out. So we're actually building an army of 400 to 500 million sperm in this, this section called the epididymis. And then when it's time to, you know, uh, fertilize or do whatever, to be sent out into the world and be free, uh, there's these contractions and it gets sent out through this long tube. Okay, so that's where they are, they're stored as well. So that's where they mature and that's where they're stored. Then you um, get sent down this long tube. Look at this long tube. It's very vast. And that's why it's called the vas deferens. So it's really long tube. So this long tube takes the sperm from outside of your body and it brings it back inside your body. Okay, it actually goes back into your abdominal cavity and then goes uh, around your bladder. So for, for, the, uh, for the boys, it's around the bladder. And it needs to um, pick up some things. It's like it's going on a trip. It needs some, you know, essentials. And it's going to pick up some of the essentials on the way out of the male body. Okay? And some of the essential things it needs is some energy. Now, sperm are microscopic. And they have to travel uh, if, if they want to do their job, which is to fertilize an egg. They have to travel up a, a, a woman's uterus into its fallopian tubes. And that can be quite the journey. Now, you might say, I, I think that's less than a meter, Mr. J. Okay, it's less than a meter. But you got to remember, they're tiny. So they're like, you got to think tiny, tiny, going up half a 50 centimeter. It's, it's a long way. One of the things they're going to do is burn a lot of energy. So um, there's this, uh, this gland called the seminal vesicle. It's these two guys right here. They look like wings. And it's right there. That's your vet seminal vesicle. Uh, they're going to deposit a whole bunch of sugary uh, solution to act as energy, fructose, right? Ends in O's, it's a sugar. And that will be used by the ATP in the, the, in the sperm to turn the little motor so it can get out of there, right? So it can swim that really long distance to get to the egg. <clears throat> There's also the prostate gland. And the prostate gland looks like this little heart. It's kind of nice. It's a heart. Uh, here's a side view of it. Still looks a little bit like heart. And that bad boy right there produces some alkaline fluid. Alkaline means base, right? And the reason why is the, uh, the, the female vagina is slightly acidic. It's not like stomach acid, pH 1. It's just slightly acidic. And that is primarily to, um, to make sure that parasites or pathogens, mainly bacteria, uh, can't cause any damage. You can't get in there and set up shop and then cause uh, an infection. So the acid there, you know, essentially kills them. Yeah? Problem is, sperm doesn't like acid either. So when they get there, it's like, oh my gosh, there's all this acid. We're all dying. So to help a uh, with that, your prostate gland will spit out some alkaline, some basic solution to neutralize a little bit and hopefully make it so that some of that 400 million, 500 million sperm survive the acid environment of the vagina. And then there's one more gland. It's this one right here. It looks like two eyeballs. And it's this little teardrop right there. That's called your cowper's gland. If you think that's too bland, right? I, I think it looks like cow eyes. And that's how I remember it's cowper's gland, cow eyes. Right there, cowper's gland. Um, it's also got a funky name called the bulbo urethral gland, right? I don't know, bulbo urethral. 
Sounds like a good name for a child, bulbal urethral. You can nickname him Bubba. Now what this does is produces a mucus lubricant. A lubricant. Okay, so a lubricant to, and, and actually, um, you know, obviously reduces friction and all that jazz, but it uh, builds a bit of a scaffolding so that, that when it's deposited into the woman's vagina, um, the sperm can use the, the scaffolding like, like uh, rope and climb up the rope, little, little rope pathways so it, it can find its way. It used to, uh, also makes a bit of a plug so when, um, when the sperm gets deposited, uh, there's a chance that uh, the woman might not be fertile at that very moment in time. So it can actually cause a little bit of a plug and keep sperm viable for a number of days uh, before the egg is released. And then once the egg is released, which is called ovulation, the sperm is ready there and, and they can get going. So uh, believe it or not, if you have, you know, uh, unprotected sex, so you, the word is copulation, and you copulate uh, on day one, most of the sperm would want to try to get to the egg on day one, but some of the sperm can stay viable in the female for a couple days later. And, and that really ups your chance of get, becoming pregnant if you miss the day of ovulation. Because to be honest, the only, of your 28 days, there's a very narrow amount of time that you can actually become pregnant of those 28 days. Right? Of those 28 days, you probably have like three, four, five days where you, you're likely to become pregnant if you have unprotected sex. And, and more likely, it's like one or two days that you have to hit on the head, right? You have to hit the calendar right on the right date before your, your, your likelihood of becoming pregnant is really high. Days around it become lower and lower, and it falls off really quickly to zero on other days. So you've got a very narrow window of time. And one of the things it wants to do is to increase those days by making a mucus plug a bit so that you can trap sperm and then release it over a couple of days. And then potentially, um, if the egg is o ovulated a day later or two days later, there's still some viable sperm there. Now, the weird thing, the strange thing about the boys bit is all of this stuff coming out of the boy actually joins the urethra, the freeway urethra. And you might say, I heard of that before. Yeah, that's your P tube. Okay? So for boys, they have a common passageway for urine and for sperm. And that's called the urethra. Girls don't. Girls have two separate pathways entirely. But boys, they have this, see this merger right here? Right there. So this is the bladder to the urethra. And this is the vas deferens to the urethra, right there, and out. So suffice to say, when uh, a boy is, uh, or a man is, a male is, um, ejaculating, you, you can't pee at the same time, right? There, there, there's like a switch system which prevents that from happening because there's no reason for pee to be, um, there's no, no, no benefit in pee in, in, in fertilization of egg. It's just the fluid coming from your testicles and then the three glands. Okay. And then you got the good old penis. That's how you pronounce it. It's not penis. Uh, pe your penis. That's the um, tube organ there that actually deposits the, it's called semen now. So when you got uh, sperm and you got the fluids, it's called semen now. So to deposit the semen as far as um, up the passage and, and to be more most advantageous, right? So it doesn't have to swim a long way, you can shorten it. The penis puts it right into the female body, okay? So that way you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, that extra little bit of travel where it could be uh, killed or attacked or die of, you know, dehydration or whatever that would come in and, and affect the sperm. Um, semen. So I just mentioned this semen is um, <clears throat> the seminal fluids plus the prostaglandins plus the sperm. Okay, so testicles make sperm. The three glands make um, the seminal fluids, and then there's something called prostaglandins too, which is a, a chemical that's created uh, that causes um, when, when it, it when it when it's deposited um, to cause the uh, woman's reproductive system to 
to kind of fluctuate, to kind of um, contract slightly. And those slight, small contractions, I'm not sure how effective they are, but the thinking is that they actually help m uh, m with the motility of the sperm, right? So they're kind of like, kind of waving, and then that's supposed to help the sperm move up against gravity and up a really far stretch relative to their size. So um, that may be the case. But what do you got? You got fructose for energy. You got basic solution to help with the acid environment of the vagina. And you got a, a lubricant from the cowper's gland, right? And then you got this, um, like I said, you got prostaglandins that cause uterine contraction. Um, this is the side view in color. So there's your elephant. That's the bum. That's the bladder. Testicle, epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicle, prostate gland, Cowper's gland, urethra, out the wee wee. There you go. Now this gland here is your prostate gland. And for most men, uh, when they hit their uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they start developing issues with the prostate gland. The prostate gland, um, it, uh, there's an idea that if, er if, if men could live long enough, they would all develop uh, prostate cancer. It's just one of those things. It's, it just happens. And some people develop issues with the prostate early and others late. And some develop cancers and others don't, but still have some issues like enlarged prostates. So at 40, we, it's recommended that you get it examined every year. And I know women, females have the same thing, right? They have to get their uh, breasts checked for, for masses. They sometimes have a, a pap smear where they, um, they do um, a smear of their cervix to see if they have any strange cells. Just, if there's any strange cells there, then it could be like, you know, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, and stuff like that, cervical cancer. So, you, uh, for, so I don't know if that's every year, but I think that is every year where you have to do that. Well, men are supposed to get this thing checked out, and it's a digital exam. And people go, oh, yeah, it's the, it's the 21st century, right? Digital, computers, all that jazz. Well, when they say digital, they say one digit, two digit, three digit, four digit. You, you get your pick. It's one of your fingers. And what the doctor does is pretty sure they put on a glove and then they just like this is how they do it they just poke in here and they feel how big that thing is that's your digital exam of your prostate and it's the cheapest way right like they don't have to order a $50 test or a hundred dollar blood test or a, you know a thousand dollar scanning photo of it they just one five cent glove or whatever a uh, little bit of Vaseline and then check it and they see if it's big and if it's big then they go into step two and step three and step four to figure out if it's a, it's a problem or not. And in fact, so many people have issues with that that, um, that um, some of them are minor, and some, so, so they get enlarged and people can't pee all the time or you know, all that stuff, or they feel like they have to pee all the time. And if it's not malignant or it's not bad, the tendency is just to leave it. Because if we, after... If you have prostate cancer and it's, it, you know, it's evolving pretty quickly and it's bad, they would, they would excise it. They cut it out. But it's wrapped around all of these tubes. So when they do it, they have to, they have to open it up and they have to like separate pieces out, right? It's like getting gum out of hair. It's, it's terrible. It's wrapped up in everything. So when we do prostate removal or excisions, it's, it's really complicated. So the, the last... You know, that's the last resort, is medical removal of it. We try to zap it with chemicals or zap it with um, radiation or other, other things. Or we just let it be, knowing that it's just slowly progressing. We're going to probably die natural causes before it gets there. But if it, it's evolving quickly, then, yeah, that's, that's a complicated surgery there. And it's in the, right in the middle of you, too. Right? It's, it's not the easiest thing to get to. All right, any questions about the uh, male anatomy? Okay, well, how do we make sperm? Well, it her happens in the gonads. That's the sex uh, organs of, of an organism. For humans, the male, it's called the testicles. For the female, it's called the ovaries. And it happens in the testes. The process is genesis, birth, right? If you're, you're religious, you know the, the first chapter is genesis. Uh, this is sperm genesis, so spermatogenesis, making sperm. And it occurs in the testicles in the seminiferous tubules, right? All the tubes of the testicle. What you have 
there's um, some cells in there, and they go through meiosis, uh, and the process is called um, spermatogenesis, and the cells are called spermatogonia. And spermatogonia will divide through meiotic division to make sperm. You also have these special cells called Sertoli cells. Some people call them nurse cells. And these cells, they nourish and take care of these developing sperm as they go through the tubes. It takes about nine to 10 weeks to get start to finish. And boys make sperm from day one of puberty all the way to when they die. So if you live to 100, you're probably making sperm for like 75 of those years. Unless you have something happen to your testicles, right? Like um, traumatic injury, right? Someone like, I don't know, someone drives a car right into your groin region or something. Or if you get cancer. Um, another thing is you can get a torsion or the testicles twist and then the blood flow gets blocked and then the testicle dies and then you have to get it removed, right? It's called torsion. Um, I heard it's really painful. Um, but if you have healthy testicles, right, and you're, you're healthy and all that stuff, you can make babies right until you're, you die. And you've seen those stories of like the 100-year-old man with, often it's like in this weird third world country or it's a super duper rich guy. Uh, and then they have a kid when they're like 70, 80, 90. Um, for females, unfortunately, you're born with your cells, your egg cells, and you make one every 28 days and then you stop at something called menopause. And that can be 30, 40, 50, 60. Uh, so your window of time to be fertile is really narrow, right? Puberty onwards up until 30, 40. You also have these interstitial cells and they make testosterone. So your testicle here makes sperm in these tubes, but it also, uh, there's special cells inside here that also make testosterone. Testosterone is the male hormone that gives men their primary and secondary sex features. Right? Like their hairy chest, their deep voice, right? their height, their muscle mass, um, their, their bone structure, uh, stuff like that. Women have something called estrogen and progesterone. Those are the, the complementary ones to the male one. Now, sperm, even though they've gone through meiosis, they got to get a tail. And that happens in the epididymis. So there's three parts. There's, sorry, there's four parts. The tail, the midpiece, the head, and then the acrosome. And let me show you what they look like. This is it. So there's the tail that's made of protein, and, and it's tubular protein. And when the tail turns, it doesn't wag like this, like a dog's tail. It actually wags like this, like a, like a helicopter propeller. It goes around and around, or an airplane propeller. And it's powered by this thing, the midpiece. And then the midpiece burns a lot of ATP. So that's where the fructose would be used. There's lots of mitochondria in here making ATP, and then ATP is being used to turn the little motor. This head is where the DNA is. So the 20, 23 uh, pieces of DNA, the 23 chromosomes that dad is going to give to the, the child. And then this acrosome is some hydrolytic enzyme to help burn its way into the egg. So when it, it matches up with the egg, it's got to burl, burl, burl. And then once it's burled its way through, then it gets to eject the, uh, the DNA into the egg. Okay, so this is, the, this is the penis. This is the thing that delivers it. Um, it's, it's like a balloon, uh, but instead of filling it with water, you fill, or sorry, air, you fill this balloon with blood. So this thing is all spongy material, and you can see all the veins and capillaries, and it fills up with blood to become uh, uh, rigid through uh, turgor pressure, in fact, right? Turgor pressure is water pressure. And then that's your urethra right there. So that's where the sperm would come uh, and the, the semen as well. Um, so this needs to be delivered. And to deliver the, the message, you have to have muscle contraction. And to trigger the muscle contraction in men, you have to reach orgasm. And the, the orgasm uh, causes the muscle contraction, which squeezes the epididymis so that this stuff uh, comes down the vas deferens, picking up the uh, sugar, picking up the mucus, picking up the basic solution so that it can come out. And that, we call that semen now. And in that semen, there's 400 to 500 million spermies in there, right? That's per shot. And then uh, after that, um, males 
have a refractory period where they can't ejaculate for a little while, you know, depending on the person, a uh, couple minutes to hours. Now, this number is mind-blowing to me as a biologist, as a scientist. Like, we're hit, sitting here, we're talking, you know, some of us are friendly, some of us can't stand each other, but the, 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 the reality is that you are one of 400 million sperm on that one day that your mom and dad, your parents, your biological parents decided to, to shake hands. One in 400 million, one, to, one in 500 million, right? Isn't that incredible? Like, th just this number alone, you shouldn't be here, 100, one in 400 million. But you have to calculate all the other factors, like the, the right day, the right month, the right year, the right person. Right, that your your mother and your father, your biological mother and father uh, chose, and then you have to extrapolate that backwards to think about all the combinations of your grandparents and your great grandparents. Like it's just mind blowing that you are here, that I'm here, because it's all every single ejaculation is one in four hundred million. If they even are trying to have, you know, uh, a child. Right? Sometimes there is no female involved sometimes. Sometimes there's not a goal or there's a barrier, right? We're, we're not even trying. But one in 400 million, in that one day, and I bet you if you ask your, your, you know, your biological mom or dad, if they only tried once, they'd say, no, we didn't try once. Like we tried for, for some people it'd be years. You know, my brother-in-law just got, they just this last month got their first child. And they had tried for five years for children um, using in vitro, using, you know, hormone replacement, using a surrogate. And then finally they had to adopt after five years, they adopted, right? Because it's, for some, it's a difficult process. It's a super difficult process. While others, right, they just have to look each other and they're pregnant. Um, but just, you know, if you were to go ask, what, was it easy? And they say, no, then just think of how more special that, the, the fact that you're here. Uh, is this is one and four hundred million just for that one day? It's incredible. Okay, men. We're going to talk about hormonal regulation, and it's super duper we, it, easy. We get to talk about it in ten minutes, and I'm going to give you a break. And now, why is it? Because men, right? If your your sex is male, uh, your male sex uh, and your hormones are like that. It's static, homeostatic, right? We're trying to keep it at one value. And we're talking about testosterone, right? And we're talking about sperm production. It's, it's all flat. Now women, I told you uh, in a typical year, we spend about a week on it because women's hormones go wink, wonk. And then they, I think there's a turn in a circle in there too. Like it's, it's really complicated. Whereas boys, straight line. Now it's not true, there's a couple spikes. There's a spike in utero, and that's the one that causes your testicles to descend and turn into a, a male appearance, right? And then there's another when you hit puberty, like at 12, 13, 14, and you're, you start getting acne and your voice drops, and you start getting hair and weird spots. And then usually you get another one a little bit later on, right? And when you get, you get your big muscle mass, um, you get taller and you, you know, everything gets deeper and everything. And that's usually like 18, 19, 20. Sometimes you get another one. So there is spikes, but we measure those in years and not in days. And with the female uh, sex, we see it in days. Okay. 28 day cycle. So the, the hormones we have to talk about are called uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Okay. And they are regulated by something called the, the hypothalamus, which releases gonadotropin releasing hormone, okay? So we have GnRH, which is a hormone from the hypothalamus, and it triggers the pituitary, but not the posterior pituitary, which releases ADH. It's the anterior pituitary, the front side of it. And it releases uh, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone both go to the testicles, okay? Now, they go into the blood circulatory system to arrive at the testicle. It's not a direct message, it's a shout out to everybody, but the testicles hear it. And the FSH tells them to make sperm. And the LH tells them to make testosterone. Okay? And because it's static, we control things at a homeostatic number, 
by something called negative feedback, right? It goes too high, we feedback, say, you're too high, go low. And you go, oh, now we're too low, feedback, go high. And it just does a slight fluctuation around the homeostatic value, or the static value. What is testosterone? Testosterone is the male hormone. Females produce it in very small uh, amounts. Uh, males produce it as their principal hormone, and it gives them their secondary sex characteristics, such as pubic hair, facial hair, chest hair, deeper voice, right? Adam's apple, that arises uh, with, your, um, with your, uh, your testosterone. Increased muscle mass, and it is responsible for your sex drive and libido. It also uh, is responsible for the maturation of your primary sex organs. And your primary sex organs are your testicles and your penis. And um, that happens after that you're, um, you're, you're in utero and you're, um, you're uh, at adolescence when you hit puberty. In fact, when you're in your mom's belly, all of us, female and male sex, we all look alike in the, pretty much in the first trimester. It's not until um, the males release this amount of testosterone that the testicles dropped or descended, and they came out. And you know, if you wanted, to, if your, your 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 aunt or your cousin came to you guys and said, "Hey, I'm pregnant," and they're like, "Oh, great! Is it a boy or girl?" It's like it's too early; we can't tell. Well, they could do a DNA test, and we could figure out if it's X, X or XY. But the the traditional way of figuring out if you've got a boy or girl is to take a photograph, and they take ultrasound. And they look at the head, they look at the chest, they look at the, you know, the legs, look at the hands, and then they look at the groin. And if you look in, in the second trimester, you'll actually see an outie versus an innie. And that's how we do it. There has been some cases where um, um, boys, males, they don't get their little burst of testosterone in utero, in, the, in, in uterus, that's what it means. And when they come out, they actually present as female. And there's stories of, and there's a documentary about this, uh, where they come out and they look like girls on the bottom half. And so what are they raised as? As girls. And then when they hit puberty, right, 12, 13, 14, and then all of a sudden their boys show up, their testicles show up, because the testosterone makes them drop. And then they've been raised as girls. And for some of them, it's an easy transition. They go, well, I knew that all along, so I'm just a boy now. Uh, but there has been... So the one documentary I'm thinking of, there is this one fellow, and he came out presenting like a girl, uh, female anatomy. And when they asked the doctor what was going on, they said, well, it's obviously a girl. And they said, well, what's this thing? And they go, uh, it must be just an enlarged clitoris or, uh, or labia majora. And so what did they do? They snipped it off. They, they, they had plastic surgery come in and and repair it. And then this fellow hit puberty, and guess what showed up later? The testicles. And they didn't have a penis anymore. So the, so the documentary continues to follow this guy with, with, his, with his, you know, realization that he's genetically male, and then his, the complexities of trying to figure out what's going to happen now. But. So that is because the testosterone didn't pr mature the primary sex organs in that early stage. And this didn't descend, didn't see the boys. There you go. So here's the hormonal co uh, control. Hypothalamus, you guys remember that part of your brain, right? And then you remember the, your pituitary gland, two different tissues, posterior, anterior. So what happens is GnRH is released, tells your anterior pituitary gland to release both LH and FSH. Those enter your circulatory system, and they arrive at your testicles, and your testicle goes, oh, hormone LH and FSH, they t they're telling us to make more sperm and more testosterone. So that's what happens. You make more sperm and more testosterone. Now, LH triggers testosterone from the Sertoli cells, and the testosterone in your blood goes up, and that is detected by your hypothalamus and your anterior pituitary. It says, hey, we got way, uh, you know, too much testosterone. And these guys respond by saying, okay, we'll just make less LH and GnRH. And then these guys disappear, and then the testicles produce less testosterone. And then the less testosterone comes back and goes, okay, we're a little low, can you do something about this? And they say, yeah, we'll just turn on GnRH and LH again, and that will make more testosterone. And remember, it's tiny fluctuations up and down. 
on, off, on, off, on, off to make testosterone. For sperm production, very similar. GnRH triggers FSH into the blood circulatory system, arrives at the testicles, and the testicles go, hey, they want us to make sperm, so they make sperm. In the process, they also produce this chemical called inhibin. And the inhibin feeds back to the GnRH and to the anteroperatory gland to say, there's too much inhibin, which means there's too much sperm being made at the moment. And they said, we can deal with this, turn off GnRH, turn off FSH, sperm production goes down. And then there would be like, okay, not enough inhibin, not enough sperm, turn it back up, right? And they go, okay, fine, let's uh, make more of this, and it goes back up again. Now, one problem with, um, lots of problems with anabolic steroids, but if you take steroids, like if you take testosterone, synthetic testosterone, and you can, if, if you want to be an athlete and you're like, oh man, I need more muscle mass, I need to be more manly, one thing you can do is you can take synthetic testosterone or you can take animal testosterone, like bull testosterone. And you'll inject it into you and your body will become more manly. But the whole time your body is feeding back to these two and saying, we need less and less and less. There's seen so much testosterone that we need to stop making it, stop making it, stop making it, stop making it. And guess what? This thing stops making testosterone altogether. And then when you come off of your testosterone, synthetic testosterone, right, you stop injecting yourself, these guys don't turn back on. So your testosterone level is really low now, and guess what happens? You start developing womanly features, like, uh, like hair in, in the wrong place, uh, fat deposits in the wrong place. In fact, you can actually start developing uh, breasts. And it's because you told your testicles to stop making testosterone because you were supplementing it, and then when you came off the supplemental, your testicles didn't turn back on. And now your body ha is really low in testosterone. And that, that's, you see that quite often with people that abuse, uh, you know, those types of steroids and stuff to, to, to try to get um, big muscle mass and stuff like that. Any questions? Okay, want to give you some time to chill out a little bit. Uh, we're going to get to the uh, female reproductive system, but uh, that's a lot of me talking. <laughs>